makes sense. This is my house district. So whoo, for house district 100. So no intention uh, and nothing about me here. Everything is about our candidate here, Jasmine Crockett. And to just talk about who she is, is amazing, especially during a time where we're seeing a lot of political turmoil. So she received her bachelor's in business administration from Rose College and then graduated from the University of Houston with her JD. So attorney Crockett has strategically made every career decision with one goal in mind, and that is protecting the civil liberties of those in underrepresented communities. So that is so important. Um, from a public defender in Bowie County to private practice, uh, Jasmine Crockett serves people in the states of Texas, Arkansas, defending them from unlawful accusations in the criminal justice system. And although the media has covered Crockett's, Crockett's boundless efforts to seek justice for beauty queen Carmen Ponder, mother Jackie Craig, and student Jordan Edwards, military vet Forrest Curry and entrepreneur Mark Hughes, very few are able to witness her relentlessness and genuine safekeeping of these individuals and also um, me personally witnessing her ability since 2016 for all of our rights. So Jasmine, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, <laughs> So, and also our sponsors. So, uh, the series sponsors are Tolton Law and the Honorable Carol and Dan Donovan. We have the meeting sponsors of Honorable Terry Barker and Dr. Garcia and the Hamilton Wingo uh, attorney practice. So, Jasmine, you decide to jump in this race. So... Yes. Thank you so much, Sydney. Thank you so yes. much to the Democratic Party for Dallas County, Carol, um, Tremont. I appreciate you um, for even having the ingenuity in these very difficult times. Um, I think that we thought it was going to be a hard time just because we were dealing with Trump um, and we were going to need to turn to Texas out so that we could turn Texas blue. But unfortunately, uh, now we've got to deal with COVID-19 as well. And so I do want to applaud you for your efforts in trying to make sure that uh, Democrats know who we are and what it is that we're doing. Um, I don't want to take too much time talking about myself simply because, well, Sydney, you did an introduction. And in addition to that, um, this race is the race that won't ever end. <laughs> so I feel as if people are tired of HD 100 and this race uh, that keeps going and going and going. And so I would imagine um, that most people are somewhat familiar with me. So I will keep it short. Um, as Sydney said, I am an attorney um, that's licensed to practice law in Texas, Arkansas, and federal courts. I've been doing so for the last 14 years. Uh, what some people don't know is that I did serve as uh, a Democratic Party chair back in the Texarkana area, which is Bowie County. Uh, I think I, I'm definitely the only, uh, I was the first woman of color and I think I was the youngest ever um, elected out there. And then some people don't know that I did run for district attorney when I was 28, so three years out of law school. Uh, I decided to throw my hat in the ring um, and run for district attorney. I won the early vote, lost on election day. Um, in a county that at this point in time is pretty red. Um, but you know, it was just what I felt was right to do at that time. And uh, that's no different than now. So I'll just move on to why now and uh, some of the most common questions that I get, which is number one, why are you running for office? And uh, it, it's pretty simple. Um, I've become frustrated as someone that goes in day in, day out, dealing with the everyday person in the courtroom, and I see things that just don't make sense, and I see judges who have their hands tied, I decided the best way to kind of help the people that I'm usually dealing with and to also help um, the judges is to untie their hands and start writing laws that make sense for the everyday person. Um, unfortunately, or yeah, I'm gonna say unfortunately, unfortunately this position only pays about $7,000 a year. And what that translates into is that the people that go down to represent uh, their various districts usually don't look like uh, 
state of Texas because there's only a certain socioeconomic class that has the ability to say, hey, I'm going to take off for the next, you know, six months and I'll be gone. Um, and I, by the way, while I'm gone, I'm not going to get paid very much money. And so when we look at our laws and wonder why they're so broken in the state of Texas, it's because it's very rare to find um, that real voice of who we are as Texas down in the 150 that are in uh, the house. And so I thought it was time as somebody who was consistently represented those that have been underrepresented. Um, I, I thought it was time that HD 100 had their voices heard. So here I am. Awesome. Awesome. So once again, if you're just tuning in, uh, we are speaking with candidate for HD House District 100, Attorney Jasmine Crockett. Again, I want to uh, visit with thanking our sponsors again for the series, the Tarleton Law Firm, and also the Honorable Carol and Dan Donovan. And meeting sponsors, we have the Honorable Terry Barker and Dr. Cantalina Garcia and the Hamilton Wingo Law Firm. So we're just gonna yeah. go ahead and jump That's into right. the questions here. So you've been practicing for quite some time. Yes. specifically in the criminal justice system, but you have also branched out into the civil area. And yeah. so with regards to the criminal justice front, what are the top three items that you really want to work on as far as pieces of legislation that you want to either change or bring something new to the table? Absolutely. Um, so the very first thing that I want to change is the age of majority in the criminal justice system here in Texas. Um, we are one of the last states that says that the age of majority for criminal justice purposes is 18 instead of, yeah, it's, we say that the age of majority is 17, I'm sorry, um, instead of 18. And most states it's 18 and anyone that has um, any medical training or not even medical training, but just any background in dealing with kids. Uh, we all know that the maturity level of 17-year-olds uh, and, and the brain development um, shows that they their brains are not fully developed even by the age of 18. So I do want to um, change that. That does a, a lot of different things. What people don't realize is that uh, by federal law, uh, 18 is the age of majority for criminal justice purposes. So Right now, uh, we have basically housing in the juvenile system for 16 on down, and then 17 is kind of like its own caveat by itself, and then we have 18 on up. Um, so it is costing us more money. Um, I also think that it's just completely inefficient to throw every 17-year-old into the criminal justice system. I think that um, they should have to go through the vetting process that exists within the juvenile system, and if someone um, is that big of a danger that we need to bring them to the adult system, then we, we will. Um, and just so that people better understand this, um, I represented a kid when I was probably about 24 or so, um, who ultimately was sent to prison for stealing candy out of the concession stand at a high school. And, you know, when people don't understand kind of how our laws can be applied, and when we're not kind of reforming them and considering the fact that we have 254 counties and not all of them are as liberal as uh, Dallas County, you end up with some of these results. And so this is a way of protecting some of our kids from um, an overzealous prosecutor um, who's throwing them directly into the school to prison pipeline. So I, I absolutely wanna change that. Um, I also wanna look at bail reform. Uh, we are seeing right now uh, in the midst of COVID-19 how important bail reform is. Um, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but in Dallas County, we do have more cases of COVID-19 in our jail than any other, um, any other county in the state. And so, you know, it's, it's this idea that I didn't have enough money to bond out and now I could possibly lose my entire life. Right. And so, you know, now it's like, well, oh, okay, the light is going off and, you know, we are getting some pretty good results um, as it relates to our judges and even as it relates to agreements from our prosecutors to get people out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I kind of wish we had that type of urgency um, on an everyday basis. 
because when you already are indigent, you lock somebody up. And even if it's just for a few days, that potentially throws their entire life into a tailspin where they are um, losing their home, losing their jobs, losing their cars, things like that. And when you are arrested initially and detained, you are presumed innocent per our constitution. So you have people that say, if I'm going to be able to feed my kid, I just have to plea so that I can get out because I can't afford to pay to get out. Um, and and I, I don't want so many people feeling pressured to enter pleas of guilty because they don't have the finances to get out. It feels like um, a your way to end everything. Absolutely. Um, and then probably my third point, um, hmm. It's a good one. I, there's so many random things. I have like specific laws. I think I think a third one that I probably will be pushing for that's probably going to take me some time as well is for us to codify speedy trial. Um, so speedy trial is a constitutionally guaranteed right, and we interpret it through case law, which case law interprets the Constitution. Um, but there are states that have codified and say this is what it means to have a speedy trial um and so i would like to actually put pen to paper and define that because uh, some people may or may not know but uh i recently had a 17 year old that was arrested for capital murder he sat in county jail for two years because he was unable to afford the bail amount that was set and uh ultimately on the day that we got to trial they ended up dismissing the case because they didn't have a, a case and um you know we didn't have a codified speedy trial so okay. i would like to actually do that right so you bring up some very um important and current issues that we have been seeing across social media and in the regular media so those are very admirable and um i know that uh those are good efforts that you're going to put in um, one thing that is definitely interesting is that you brought up, you know, the financial hardships for everyone. And with looking at how this pandemic is playing out, so on Tuesday, um, you spoke in front of Stonewall Democrats. And could you talk more about your business and how it's been affected by COVID-19 because this is affecting everyone pretty much the same way. Absolutely. So um, I am a small business owner. So uh, I have a sweet spot for small business owners. Um, I've been frustrated by the big package that was supposed to, you know, be so big and pretty, however he says sure. what he says, right? Um, and all the money or a good portion of the money did not go to small businesses. Um, so I say all that to say that going into this legislative session, we are going to have to have someone that understands business, number one, which as you've already read, that is my background. I was a business major. Um, and number two, what really needs to be done to get resources to small businesses. So I do want to take just a quick moment to applaud our city council um, that has passed their own package. Um, to help out local small businesses and make sure that they can survive this. And uh, they are also looking out for um, the everyday person. Um, and so they have suspended um, any evictions. And so I, I applaud our, the leadership on the city level um, for the things that they're doing. But overall, prior to COVID-19, um, there is a financial crisis that exists without, within the majority of my district. And uh, it's, it's more so in the Southern sector and even in the Western Dallas uh, portion of the district. And understanding that, you know, the reality is that the majority of people are continually trying to figure out how they are going to feed themselves. And so we've got to come up with how is it that we are actually going to number one, supply the needs to everyone that needs them when we're in a situation where we're gonna be in a deficit um, because we don't have money that's going to be pouring in to our state budget. And so, you know, just to kind of draw a comparison between myself and my opponent, uh, we were outspent by over $250,000. And the difference that that $250,000 got my opponent was three percentage points. 
we can't afford to have someone go to Austin that is not cognizant of um, every single dime, especially when we have a district that does have the amount of poverty that it has. We've got to be really good stewards of that money that we are getting in and we've got to maximize the resources. And I think that that's something that our campaign has done from day one is we decided that we were going to maximize resources. And that is a uh, great point to hear. And that is something that with my show, I have definitely hammered in on is making sure that we have great stewards of our tax dollars because the people are not ATM machines. So what are your thoughts then on property tax relief? Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is maybe the one thing that unites the district no matter what part of the district you're in, as we knock doors and talk to people, everyone was um, needing and wanting property tax relief. And so I don't really like this idea that artificial outside sources um, end up inflating your property tax uh, valuation, right? So by that, what I mean is, if you live in West Dallas, which is where I am, and uh, you've lived in this house for the last 30 years, and you've not done anything to improve this house, but all of a sudden somebody moves across the street from you, and now they say, well, the value of your home has gone up 10 times. Um, there's actually a restauranteur in West Dallas who was almost brought to tears as I was campaigning and talking to him, and he told me that they literally have one of the longest standing restaurants in West Dallas. They've been there since 1972, I believe, and it's a family-owned restaurant and his property tax bill increased from, I wanna say $9,000 to $18,000 in one year. And there were no improvements made. Um, so I want to be able to actually grandfather people in um, so that it's not an absolute grandfathering because we buy homes so that they do appreciate, they are assets. So they do actually increase in valuation. But instead of the honest being on the homeowner, to say, hey, I want to protest this. I want to protest because that can be a complicated process. It can be very technical. Then I want to basically put a cap. So if for some reason um, your property taxes are going to go up, I'm just throwing a number out. I'm not saying this is the number. They're going to go up 10%, right? Anything more than 10%. Then at that point in time, uh, the tax assessor cannot assess more than that 10% um, unless they show why they should be able to increase it, you know, this 20, 30, 40%. So I just kind of want to do a little bit of burden shifting um, so that people who, especially in my district, are trying to work hard every single day just to put food on the table, that they're not having to figure out the complicated situation to, to get their property tax relief. Okay, great. So to shift gears, um, it seems that the Republicans are still waging a war on women. As a state rep, what will you do to protect a woman's right to choose? <laughs> Especially with all of the memes and chaos going on about disinfectants right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know me, we're, but not everyone knows me. I don't interject comedy. <laughs> we're, we're, we're so not going there with your president. Um, but I will say uh, my cousin, uh, most people don't know, um, she works for the AFIA Center. I don't know how many of you are familiar with AFIA, but they are women's reproductive rights activists. Yes. Um, and when I say activists, like they put the act into ivist, right? Um, so they stay down in Austin. And I don't think it's going to be any different uh, once I'm down there. Uh, I think it may be a little worse on me because this is my first cousin. But the reality is that I unfortunately have had friends um, I can specifically recall one of my closest friends who wanted to have her child. Um, unfortunately, the doctor basically said, if you continue this pregnancy, you're going to die. And, you know, it was like all these questions asked, well, can we do this? Can we do that? And no, it was, you're going to die. And so this idea that people think that they should be able to sit in judgment of someone else's health is, is infuriating um, for someone to say, hey, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do as grown adults. And wow. so I'm not here for it. Uh, in short, I'm not really going to be shy about it. Anybody that knows me knows that that's just not what I am. I'm not shy. Your style. 
And, and frankly, I, I think that we need, you know, the theme of our campaign is fire. And that's because I think that we need to light a fire in Austin. I am so tired of complacency and let me play along to get along um, because right is right and wrong is wrong and it needs to be called out. And in a safe democratic seat, it should not be a question about um, how bold someone will stand for something as foundational as th this is this is a healthcare right as far as I'm concerned. Um, and obviously I can still deal with the other side of things where, you know, I've had somebody that impregnated someone through rape. I, you know, even as the defense attorney, I don't think that a woman should then be precluded. And I don't think that you should draw out the scenarios and have people have to reveal their personal business about why it is that they are choosing to take this route. Yes. Exactly. And so um, I plan to be an ally. I plan to be actually kind of a leader when it comes to women's reproductive rights, especially when it comes to black women. We, we're just now coming off of um, black maternal mortality uh, week. And it's frustrating because when you look at the numbers, especially in the state of Texas, um, the mortality rate when it comes to black women and having babies, it's absolutely astronomical. And so I will be on the front lines and I will not be hushed. Okay, great. So we do have another question here as around property taxes. So what will it take to institute forgiveness of back property taxes to keep property in the hands of legacy owners? I like that. Yes. Um, so, okay, so this is amazing. I'm sorry, you guys. I just got really happy um, because I can't go out and knock doors. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it is so awesome because I get so many great ideas from actually talking to people in the district, right? And them telling me their needs. So um, to me, it would just be a matter of advocating. So, so here's the deal. On the state level, we do have some control as relates to parameters for the tax assessors. Um, and so I do believe that there, there potentially could be um, something that we could do around that realm. I think that that's amazing, especially um, in my district, because it is a majority minority district. And uh, I am consistently seeing these titles that have not been taken care of and uh, generations kind of losing uh, their property. So I, I would love to talk to my legislative team and actually work on something um, to that extent, because that's something that, that directly affects my district. So I, I love that. I think that there's uh, an absolute possibility for it if uh, I just kind of craft it. Okay, great. So healthcare, we cannot get Medicaid expansion. So what will you do to obtain these necessary funds for the health of all Texans? Yeah, so, um, Obviously, this is a huge topic on every level of government. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we probably need a new governor <laughs> um, to help us out with expansion in the state of Texas. Um, we probably need to pick up not only enough seats on the House side, but we probably need to do a little work on the Senate side as well um, before we can get that expansion. Um, so while I am an advocate for it, I am here for it, I don't believe that I should spend my entire session um, kind of focused on that one thing because there are so many hurdles and I'm one of 150, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's about thinking outside the box and making sure that we are putting money into um, things that will still provide resources. So for instance, um, I think that especially in our rural areas, because we're constantly hearing about the uh, healthcare issues in the rural areas, we need to make sure that they've got the broadband and whatever resources that they need so that we can make telemedicine uh, a reality. Um, we need to expand upon telemedicine. So I think that that's something that we could do and we could make sure that we're putting the money in um, from our budget. Um, and that way, at least we know that there's access to some kind of additional resources um, for those that are definitely in the rural areas um, or, or even just otherwise, a lot of times 
We're seeing that our ERs are packed because people don't have primary care physicians. So anytime anything happens, they kind of just go to the ER. Um, and unfortunately, it can cause problems for people that really need to be in the ER. Um, so I absolutely believe if we could get uh, expand upon telemedicine, if we could put more money into some of our community health um, centers, that we can at least provide additional resources. And, uh, and obviously we need to make sure that we're trying to get as much money into organizations such as Planned Parenthood um, that can take care of women, not just from an abortion standpoint, but take care of them uh, in all their reproductive issues. All right, great. So what experiences have you had which have best prepared you to become a legislator? Because that has been a huge criticism that people have um, that feel uh, you have to have a p position or a seat before getting another seat. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, the way that these legislators are technically set up is that it's supposed to be the voice of the people. And so I think that the best experience that I have is the fact that I actually deal with the people, I touch the people consistently. It is hard to represent somebody if you don't take the time to get to know them and know what their issues are and know what it is that they need. Um, instead, you end up being kind of a talking head that's doing what you just think is best. But in addition to that, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people um, probably don't really put very much stock or value into the fact that I am an attorney, but the reality is that the main job is to write the laws for the state of Texas. And so unfortunately, sometimes we get these laws that don't make sense, but it's because people that don't understand how they're applied are writing them. And so I do understand how they'll be applied. Um, in addition to having strong relationships with so much of the judiciary, where I would be able to say, hey, what is it that you're seeing consistently that is problematic? The job is to write the laws for the state of Texas. That is our main job. And so my experience practicing law um, definitely equips me, but, but more so than anything, me actually talking to the people and finding out what matters to them so that I can push for legislation that will truly make some positive change in their lives, I think is what best qualifies me. Okay, excellent. So. Um, we're getting close here with time, and I definitely want to ask this question because education was so huge during the last legislative sessions. So what still needs to be done with public education in Texas? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're asking me these, like, compound questions. Um, <laughs> so I, all I'm going to say about education is that we've got to put more money into it. In the story. Um, we're seeing right now, especially in the southern sector, um, this disconnect uh, and the disparity because we've got all these children that did not have the ability to be able to get online, to be able to have their classes. So uh, we definitely got to put more money into the technology. Um, we've got to put more money um, behind our teachers. We've got to put uh, more incentives. So even if we uh, aren't necessarily putting the actual dollars in, maybe there's some forgiveness that we can do if people are going to say um, certain uh, state institutions um, so that we can maybe forgive some loans if they come and kind of work in some of our schools. But we've got to get creative. We've got to make sure that overall we're putting more money in from retirement standpoint to um, just even making sure that our educators have the money that they need to buy uh, or, or the schools have what they need to buy as well as the, the teachers have an incentive to actually go down there and work. And so they're making a, a, a reasonable salary. Okay, well, I think with the pandemic and parents having to be at home with their kids, I think that uh, quite a few people would be like, amen to that. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. With, that, <laughs> with that in mind, how do you propose getting our economy back on track, especially since we have Harris and Dallas County, especially? Um, County Judge Clay Jenkins um, been such an advocate for protecting everyone's health. So how do we get economy going and we still protect everybody's health? Yeah, so um, right now the priority has to be in testing. That's just the reality. Unfortunately, we are going to live in a time where we will be wearing masks for some time. Um, we will not be shaking hands for some time. 
Um, and so we will have a new normal for some time because we are still waiting on vaccines and um, even just drugs to treat uh, the coronavirus. And so uh, we've got to make sure that we have the ability to number one, test, um, as well as we need to make sure that we can track and do the tracing that's necessary so that when someone does encounter someone and they test positive, um, we've got that. Before we do any of that, that's kind of foundational, right? So you build a house and you don't have a foundation, guess what, the house falls apart. And so we are looking at potentially um, putting ourselves even further behind if we rush this and don't do it the right way. So. For me right now, especially if we're going into the next session and this is still such a huge issue and we don't have the resources, we are going to have to spur innovation to make sure that we are getting adequate testing um, and making sure that it's for a nominal amount so that we can get as much as we need um, so that we can get uh, widespread testing first okay. and foremost. Great. So uh, definitely uh, it feels like this time flew by just like when you were on Coffee and Politics. Um, and I hate to wrap this up, um, but I do want to thank our sponsors again, the Siri sponsors, uh, Tarleton Law Firm, the Honorable Carol and Dan Donovan, our meeting sponsors, the Honorable Terry Barker and Dr. Cantalina Garcia, as well as Hamilton and Wingo, LLP. So, Jasmine, in closing, what would you like to let everyone know? Yeah, so um, number one, go to jasmineforone100.com. <laughs> I would love to earn your support. Um, there's so many resources on there and so much information about me. Um, but in short, uh, this specific district, I can't speak for any other district, this district needs a real voice. And it's more than just saying that you're a voice, it's more than saying that you're a fighter. You can Google the issues that I'm talking about and see that I've been fighting for those issues on the front lines. And so we really need to push to have someone that walks the walk and talks the talk. And there's only one person that's doing that and that is me. Um, I, I'm not a career politician. I'm not hooked up with the in crowd or whatever. And guess what? That means that I'm not beholden to anybody but the people of the district. And so the way that I phrase my candidacy is that we are a throwback campaign because we are trying to return the power to the people. And the only way that it's gonna happen is if I'm elected. All righty, and everybody get out there and vote. And to that point, uh, thank you again, Jasmine, for coming on. At 6 p.m., we do have the incumbent, Lorraine Bil Bilby, coming on as part of the series. So this was not a joint effort with having both candidates on. So make sure you tune back in for House District 100 at 6 p.m. so you can hear the incumbent talk. So again, Jasmine, thank you so much. Uh, Carol Donovan and our other sponsors, thank you again for making sure that this series um, was able to happen during this time. Thank you so much. Thanks.